Well, good afternoon. My name is Bill LaCourse, and I am the Dean of the College of Natural Mathematical Sciences, and I welcome you here today. And on behalf of UMBC and the college, uh, we're happy to uh, present again the Regis Premier Life Science event. Uh, this is the 17th annual A Look Ahead, and we've changed the title a little bit from the past. We're you know, looking at explorations and transformative research. And uh, typically, just to give you some background of what we do here, is we bring some very renowned leaders in the field, people who have changed the discipline and had major impacts. Uh, and we bring them forward so that we can be inspired by what they've done and what we, the potential in us for what we can do. And today's event uh, brings together quite a lot of different people. We have scientists and uh, students and faculty from, from across the region. Uh, we have the poster sessions. The posters are really set up to focus on the distribution of work that takes place in the faculty's labs to showcase what we do. Uh, the students here hopefully can network with the people that attend. Uh, alumni are a part of this, and we welcome all the alumni that come to here. And uh, I encourage the students to talk with our corporate sponsors and the people that are here. And through the generosity of our sponsors, this symposium generates much needed funding, especially in the climate, the economic climate that we serve. And uh, we're very grateful to the support of Shepard Mullen, Metamune, Baxter, and Grace for helping us out in this way. Uh, it's because of their generous support that we can host this event. That's what a lot of the funding goes for. Uh, but also, the undergraduate research symposium that's hosted by the college in the fall, which brings about 400 people to the campus, it's about 200 posters, and it's from up and down the East Coast. And uh, it's partially funded by the NIH, but as we many of us know that the NIH doesn't support food at functions, and so the remainder of the funds that we get from these events are used to help sponsor that event. So it leverages the resources that we do have. And so I'd like to have everybody join me in thanking our sponsors again for this year with a round of applause. So this first 15 minutes is like a commercial here. The good stuff comes. Uh, this is a, a bit of a warm-up act. So. But there continues to be a lot of excitement here at UMBC. Uh, I'm proud to report, at least it's been told me by the president of the university, that we're one of the few campuses in the system that have grown in enrollment. And that's really uh, attributable to the reputation of UMBC, to the staff and faculty. It is a national model for preparing students, and we have achieved something that I think was intended from the beginning stages of UMBC in the early 60s, which is to be a diverse campus and to supply the professional schools in the area. And we are a highly diverse public university, and that in itself is an achievement. It is the fifth year in a row that we've been recognized as up and coming and number one in the nation. In addition, we've been recognized as a top university where the faculty have an unusual commitment to undergraduate teaching. And if you stay here at UMBCLF enough, you don't actually see it as unusual. It's just the way of life here at UMBC. And sometimes it takes others uh, to tell us how difficult, what we do here. And we're in with the company of William and Mary, Berkeley, Princeton, and Brown. So I'd like to take this moment to thank the faculty and the staff and all those for their excellent and teaching and reaches to support the facility with a round of applause. Thank you. Because it's not the buildings, it's the people that make the difference. Just a little bit of the overview of the college. We have five, uh, five departments and two centers, biological sciences, chemistry and biochemistry, math and statistics, marine biotechnology, physics, we also have the Center of Space Science Technology and the Institute of Fluorescence. These departments are very collaborative. They work with the other colleges and across the different disciplines. Uh, the college is home to 2,613 undergraduate majors and are enrolled in 13 bachelor's programs, 333 graduate students, 29 MS, PhD, and post bac and non-degree programs. And the undergraduate enrollment in the life sciences continues to increase as well as our graduate programs, including our master's in biotechnology, which is represented here today. And we are expanding that to the universities at Shady Grove. And so the reach of UMBC hopefully is growing in the county. Research expenditures are strong. They're up around 18 million. I guess that's presidentially speaking. It's just a shy under that. Uh, and this year it looks very promising that we'll be growing that number as well. 
So some of the college highlights, one of the major achievements of the college this year, is, the past years, is benefit UMBC Reachers and total community, is the elected characterization analysis complex in the Meyerhoff building. Uh, this office is full service to not only the internal customers, but people in the research parks. And uh, it continues to do well and to interact with the sort of scientific community. We just dedicated yesterday, and we were, had Barbara McCul Senator Barbara Mikulski on campus, the Science Education uh, Science Learning Collaboratory, where we have a new facility. It's about 3,000 square feet. It hosts 24 students at a time. And this is to have innovative ways of doing wet lab uh, science ex education. In the Department of Marine Biotech, you know, one of the proud parts, of, good parts of being about Dean is you get to extend your, your visits to different places. And I've always loved visiting uh, Marine Biotech downtown. And they have a lot of interesting programs from enhanced environmental sustainability and salmon fishing, uh, the life cycle of the bluefin tuna, and a lot of bioremediation work on PCBs. And there's cross-campus relationships here. Yoni Zohar, Zohar is somewhere in the audience here. If you want to see something phenomenal, visit, visit his facility. Uh, and he doesn't hurt to have donations to it as well, right? And we were really proud. And the other thing is last year, at the October 9th, I believe it was, Jean-Michael Cousteau was here and gave a fabulous speech. And uh, I'm looking forward to next event of that nature on campus. Should also note that the Chemistry Biology Interface Program that was sponsored by NIH was refunded again for another five years. Uh, and this is an interdisciplinary training program at the cutting edge between those two disciplines. Faculty and staff continue to be, have much success. Uh, just as they won't have all of them here, but Jeff Leips received the Regents Award for Excellence in Teaching. Justin Johnson received the Jakubic Family Endowment Award. Sarah Lupin, I don't know if everybody's aware of this, has been given the, has been awarded the 2014 Carl Weber Excellence in Teaching Award. Rich Carpell, Fulbright uh, Award, Brazil Scientific Mobility Program, Distinguished Chair. Michael Summers with Freeman Baus is the winners of the Ruth Kirstein Diversity in Science Award. Uh, a number of uh, awards with the SEED programs with UMB where we're increasing our relationships for different levels of research with the medical school. Kathleen Hoffman, Brad Percy, Charles Biebrick, Marine Christine Danielle. Uh, I know that Sue Rosenberg got a, uh, an award with the Metamune. Uh, Recently, Marchin, I heard about a recent award from the NSF they received. The list is very extensive and continues on. And I'm really proud of the leadership of our chairs uh, and the efforts that they do in promoting research and keeping their academic programs uh, going forward. Uh, we also like to really uh, talk about how we can attract uh, very significantly uh, superb faculty and I'd like to extend a special welcome to our new colleagues. If you haven't met him, Zev Rosenweg is chemistry and biochemistry. He's the new chair. Uh, someone just described him today that he doesn't let any grass grow under his feet. And uh, we can acknowledge this. He's busy and doing a lot of things. Matthew Pelton is in physics. Aaron Green from biological sciences. And Haiwan Kang from math and statistics. Uh, UMBC is interested not only in the research, which we'll see highlighted here today, but we also are interested in the understanding the pedagogy of how students learn and investigating what works and what doesn't. Uh, we have a number of programs, an NSF-funded iCube study, which is nearing a mid-phase where the implementation is cutting back and the research, the data analysis is looking into, where we're looking at what are the most effective ways for doing, interacting with students to make them successful. Uh, we have a Nexus grant funded by HM, HHMI, where we have a multi-partnership uh, arrangement here for universities to get together. Can you teach competencies? Can you assess competencies? And that's the quantitative aspects of uh, biological science education, life science education. And we're also working with transfer students with a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, undergraduate research continues to be a focus. Large number of students have participate. 19th annual ERCAD. We had something on the order of 90 posters and oral presentations with 107 student participations. We are here about education. We are training professionals from day one. And we will on Friday, this has been a week of busy events, but on Friday we'll have the CNMS Student Recognition Day. And the college will recognize 70 of its students who are receiving honors and awards for excellence in academics and service. And we'll also have more students who have been invited to join the Honor Society chapters in this campus. So accolades across the spectrum. That's just a little bit of background on what we've been doing in college as an update. 
and uh, we're going to look forward to another successful year. But on to this event. Uh, we do have two fabulous speakers here today, uh, very distinguished. First is Dr. Phyllis Robinson, professor of biology at UMBC, and I'll do a short introduction in a moment. And uh, our second speaker will be Dr. Eve Moner from Brandeis University. And so, just for a brief introduction, Phyllis Robinson received her BA degree in biology, biology from Wesley College, her PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and was a postdoctoral fellow at Brandeis University. Uh, she joined the faculty at UMBC as an assistant professor in 1992. I didn't know we had that in common until I was reading it, so I'm very honored. And received a tenure and associate professor, made it to the rank of full professor at UMBC. Her research has focused on the problems of phototransduction, how light is transformed into biological signal. In particular, much of her research was concentrated on visible pigments, the molecules directly involved in light detection. So I loved it because it was about chemistry, and it's hot. So you can see how close these departments are. The University System of Maryland Board of Regents has recognized Phyllis for mentoring with a faculty award for excellence in mentoring in 2002, and she received the mentoring award from the Leadership Alliance in 2006. But Phyllis is really well known for her efforts to increase the participation of women and minorities in science at UMBC. She co-founded the Women in Science and Engineering Group at UMBC. She was a co-PI in the UMBC NSF Advanced Grant, which has since been institutionalized in the university. And she currently co-chairs the University Executive Committee on Gender and Diversity in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And recently, UMBC's President's Commissions on Women in 2012 recognized her work on behalf of women in STEM with an Achievement Award. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Phyllis Robinson to the stage. Can you hear me? Okay, well thank you Bill for that nice introduction and it's a real honor to be here, be asked to talk at uh, Look Ahead and to be the warm up act for uh, Eve Mata who I've known for a while since I was a postdoc and she's probably one of the smartest scientists I know and one of the most gracious individuals you could meet. Um, so today I'd like to give you a tour of some work my laboratory has done um, on melanopsin, which is a uh, novel and unique uh, visual pigment uh, found in the vertebrate and mammalian retina. Um, and if you took biology um, great more than uh, 15 years ago, you probably did not know this was not in your biology textbook. Um, so let's see if this works. Okay, so an overview of what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you about uh, visual functions performed by photoreceptors give you an introduction to visual pigments, probably the most interesting molecule there are, and, uh, and then uh, a brief introduction to melanopsin and um, uh, tell, give you a, a brief tour of some of the research that my laboratory has done over the last 10 years. So um, vision is a uh, important sense and in um, Many organisms have evolved different kinds of visual receptors and eyes. Um, it gives the, an, an animal the ability to find food, um, avoid predators, find a mate, or find prey. Um, but today, and so the evolution has come up with lots of different solutions for uh, detecting light and processing it. Today we're going to function, focus on the uh, mammalian eye. Um, and um, uh, a visual pigment that's expressed in, in the uh, mammalian retina. So here is a retina. Uh, this is a uh, human retina. Here's the eye. The retina is a uh, light sensitive tissue at the back of the eye. We have the cornea and lens that focus the light in the back of the eye. If we take this tissue and turn it around, you can see that there are three layers of cells so here is the front of the eye, so the light goes through these cells. And here are the classical photoreceptors. We have rods, which are rod-like, and cones. The rods are involved in dim light vision, 
and the cones are involved in bright light and color vision. Um, and then we have uh, neurons here that process the information. And up until the uh, year 2000, the people had been studying the retina for probably 150 years. People were assumed that these were the only photoreceptors in the mammalian eye. In about 2000, uh, not too far from here at Yousef, uh, Dr. Iggy Provincio found that there were a, a small subset of retinal ganglion cells that were light sensitive and they expressed a uh, visual pigment that called melanopsin. And the reason it's called melanopsin is that the gene was first discovered in the melanocytes of frog, uh, uh, frog mel melanocytes. Um, so the, the mammalian eye performs two sets of functions. There's image and non-image forming vision. So most of us are conscious of image forming vision. When we go to beautiful places, we take a look at our grandmother, we're using our image forming vision. And the projections from the retina, from the ganglion cell, go to these red um, nuclei here, the lateral geniculus nucleus and the superior colliculus. These um, uh, ganglion cells that express melanopsin are involved in non-image forming vision and they project to a host of other nuclei that are involved in processing light information that we're not very conscious of. And so what we see is that in non-image forming vision, we have photoreceptors that are detecting light they need, they're just telling the, the brain that they see light, and they're involved in uh, regulating a host of uh, physiological processes like circadian photoentrainment, pupillary light response, suppression of locomotion, sleep regulation, and migraines. Um, image forming vision, which we're all aware of, has uh, fairly rapid kinetics, high spatial resolution, and allows animals to track uh, and detect objects. And so today we're going to focus on non-image forming vision. So in terms of vision, visual pigments are well-designed protein switches. And many of the properties that we see of physiological properties of photoreceptors are actually determined by the, these visual pigments. Um, and it turns out that visual pigments are also a quintessential G-protein coupled receptor. G-protein coupled receptors are the most successful receptor class. Um, there's about 2,000 of them. Our human genome has 800 of them. And so, um, um, so they are one of the largest membrane receptors. They have a highly conserved uh, structure, which is seven transmembrane helices and they uh, respond to their stimuli by coupling to G, G uh, binding protein, GTP binding protein. And what's, un what's interesting in terms of pharmaceutical companies is that a third to a half of all the drugs that are sold in the market target um, G protein coupled receptors. And so what we learn about visual pigments is interesting for vision, but it also tells us something about this large class of very important receptors. So here is a three-dimensional structure of a visual pigment. This is bovine rhodopsin that was actually uh, one of the, was the first G-protein coupled receptor to be crystallized in 2000 by Chris Polchewski. And what's unique about visual pigments in this whole class of G-protein coupled receptors is that there's this seven transmembrane protein and there's a chromophore, in our case, 11 cis retinal, that is covalently attached to this uh, lysine in the seventh transmembrane helix by a shift base linkage. And this chromophore, 11 cis retinal, is derived from vitamin A. And so your mother was right, eat carrots, it helps your vision. Um, and the only effect of light in all of vision is to isomerize this bond, this 11 cis bond, to an all fit trans configuration. And that reaction takes place in about 200 femtoseconds. And so what we can think about it is the 11 cis retinal is actually an antagonist in light and rapidly creates an agonist for this G protein coupled receptor. So a visual pigment is a protein and a chromophore. 
And the interaction of the chromophore with the protein causes uh, us to have a, an absor uh, the visual pigment to have an absorption. And depending on the modification of the pi electrons in that chromophore uh, conjugated double bond, we get absorption maximum a very different uh, maximum. And so here is the human visual pigments. Here's the rod visual pigment that absorbs about 500 nanometers. And then everybody who uses the computer knows the cones. We have blue, green, and red, RGB. And so combining a chromophore and a uh, protein, we get a visual pigment that has absorption in the light range. So in the, the era of genomics, we can um, sequence, a, 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 there's, we have the sequence of many G protein coupled receptors, and we can do an evolutionary analysis. And there are actually five groups of, of uh, G protein coupled receptor, the largest being the rhodopsin group. And here you see the opsins in, uh, lar in this large family. Um, and included in this family are olfactory receptors, and peptide receptors. And so we have a family of very important uh, receptors that mediate many physiological properties. And here is our opsins, which combine with a chromophore to make our visual pigments. So the visual pigment that we're going to focus on today is melanopsin. This pigment is involved in non-image forming vision. It regulates circadian rhythm, pupil constriction, uh, and uh, photic regulation of sleep, and it may also be involved in mood, depression, memory, and learning. So even though it's a novel uh, and recently described, it has many functions, and even though there are only 1,000 to 2,000 ganglion cells, it seems to uh, regulate many non-image forming processes. So here's just an example of photoentrainment. Here we have an actogram and we have a mouse Every time it runs on this uh, wheel, uh, it, we get a little click. And so if we keep the mouse in the dark, we get a, their activity and, and they are free running, but it, their circadian rhythm is around 24 hours, but a little short. If we turn the light on, we see that we can entrain the activity um, to 12 and 12 hours again, and then we put it in the dark again, it becomes free running. So this is what we uh, refer to as photo entrainment. So in the mouse retina, if we take an antibody to this protein and stain the retina and then uh, visualize it with fluorescence, we see that there are a few cells that have dendritic uh, arbor, and so it, we get this arbor across the whole mouse retina um, uh, lighting up uh, with an anti-melanopsin antibody. So the ganglion cells that uh, express this antibody are light sensitive. And here in this experiment, this is David Burson's laboratory at Brown, he injected a dye so that we could recognize these ganglion cells and then he recorded from them in response to light. And what you see is a transient depolarization where firing action potentials. This is in contrast to our classical rods and cones which hyperpolarize in response to light. So here's a two-dimensional model of the melanopsin structure. It has its qu uh, quintessential G-protein coupled receptor, seven transmembrane helices, a very long C-tail, and three intracellular loops that are involved in coupling to G-proteins and other proteins like uh, kinase. So the overall goal of my laboratory has been to characterize the spectral and biochemical properties of melanopsin and, and to determine um, the biochemical pathways that un underlie and mediate the light response that I just showed you. So the questions that we first asked was, where is the spectral properties of melanopsin? Um, and what is the chromophore of melanopsin? I told you that rods and cones use 11 cis retinal, but there are other derivatives of, of uh, 11 cis retinal that could be used for melanopsin. So this is the work that, um, oop. Oop. Marquise Walker did in my laboratory. So he took several mouse retinas and he was able to, using an affinity uh, antibody column, actually purify melanopsin from the mouse retina and 
get a spectral analysis in the dark and then bleach it in the light. And we see that the mouse melanopsin fits a model of a visual pigment with an absorption of about 500 nanometers, which is a little redshifted from what actigrams of mice um, would predict. The next thing he wanted to do uh, oh, am I going backwards here? Um, the next thing he wanted to do is determine the chromophore. So we extracted the chromophore from melanopsin and used HPLC. And what you see is in the dark, a dark adaptive mouse has a, uh, had the chromophore is 11 cis retinal. And when we expose it to light, we get a, um, a, we extract a retinal ester that has an absorption of all trans retinal. So we determined that in the mouse itself, the melanopsin is a visual pigment and it binds 11 cis retinal. So the next question we wanted to ask is what was the biochemical pathway mediating the intrinsic light response? So like, I'd first like to show you a cartoon of a visual pigment signaling. And so uh, here we have a uh, visual pigment, the 11 cis retinal. We shine light, the chromophore isomerizes, the G protein coupled receptor changes its conformation. It can now bind a G protein. The G protein binds to the uh, opsin and it exchanges a GTP for GDP. Now it changes its conformation and um, um, <laughs> this thing goes too fast here. Um, okay. Anyways, the, this, uh, the G protein is inactivated by a, a kinase and the binding of arrestin, which prohibits uh, further activation. So we've been trying for a long time to figure out what the G protein, the cognate G protein is of melanopsin. And we have some ideas, but those experiments have not been definitive. So what I'm going to focus on today is the work that we've done looking at the deactivation of melanopsin. So if you remember that uh, electro, uh, electrical recording of the intrinsically sensitive photoreceptor, you saw that it activated. And then when the light turned off, it inactivated with slow kinetics. And so what we wanted to ask is, is melanopsin activity modulated by phosphorylation, which is the, the overriding paradigm for G protein coupled receptors, and is arrestin involved in mediating melanopsin's deactivation? So here is a uh, secondary structure of melanopsin. If we run the um, protein through a predictive program, you see that in the uh, blue dots, these are uh, serines and threonines that are predicted to be phosphorylated by a G protein receptor kinase, which is a, a class of protein, the kinases, that has, um, phosphorylates the carboxy tail of G protein coupled receptors. So to ask the question whether this melanopsin is actually phosphorylated, we designed an in vitro kinase assay. What we did is we had the gene for mouse melanopsin. We expressed it in a heterologous expression system, purified the membranes, reconstituted them with a chromophore 11 cis retinal, added radioactivity, and then looked at the uh, incorporation of uh, uh, a radioactive phosphate uh, into the protein. And what we see is that in um, a, there, there's a light-dependent incorporation of, into melanopsin of radioactivity, and that it's dependent on the serines and threonines because if we make a, a mutant of melanopsin where we removed all the serines and threonines from the carboxy tail, then we see no light-dependent uh, accumulation of counts. So we wanted to ask now ask, is this phosphorylation physiologically relevant? Does it happen in the retina? And um, my, the grad student that um, performed these experiments, Joe Blasick, brought to the lab this uh, assay called a proximity-dependent ligation assay. 
And so this is a, uh, an assay that utilizes two antibodies and, and primary antibodies. And if the protein or their epitope are within 40 nanometers, we're going to get a reaction. So we first interact uh, the, our tissue with two primary antibodies. And then we have secondary antibodies. And instead of fluorescent probes, what we have is we have complementary DNA. We throw in some enzymes, we get a, them to ligate, and get a rolling circle, we get DNA amplification, and then add a fluorescent probe for um, DNA. And so wherever we see a little red dot, we know that our two primary antibodies are within 40 nanometers of each other. So using that, we took some mouse retina and we probed it with an anti uh, carboxy tail melanopsin antibody and an anti serine phosphate antibody. And in the dark, you see very few um, red spots. And I don't know if you can see that, but in the light, um, there are a, several, many. Uh, red dots in the uh, ganglion cell layer, it's demonstrating that there is light-dependent phosphorylation of melanopsin in the mouse retina. So then we wanted to ask, was, what is the role of this uh, light-dependent phosphorylation? And so to answer this question, we use a calcium imaging assay. So we, we transfected um, HEK cells or tissue culture cells with melanopsin reconstituted them and then we loaded them with a calcium indicator dye. Now if melanopsin act is activated and uh, act is able to activate a GQ pathway, uh, channels will open and calcium will come in and we will be able to detect using a fluorescent plate reader the accumulation of uh, the indicating there's calcium. And so the kind of data we get is depicted here. So in the, uh, when we shine a light using wild type melanopsin that's been transfected, we get a rapid increase in fluorescence that decays over time. If we do the same experiment with melanopsin that have, we've removed all these serines and threonines and it can't be phosphorylated, we get um, a, no, we, we, the calcium stays up and we don't see much deactivation. So this suggests to us that the phosphorylation of melanopsin is important in controlling the kinetics of the melanopsin light response. So the next question is, in the, in the model of G-protein coupled receptors, is that um, once the carboxy tail is, is um, phosphorylated, that those uh, phosphorylations activate a small molecule called arrestin. And there, um, and I told you there are 2,000 uh, G-protein coupled receptors, or and we have about 800 of them. Well, there are only four arrested molecules in our genome. Two of them are a cone and a rod visual arrested, and then there's a beta arrested one and two. And what's different about beta arrested one and two is they have some. Uh, domains that allow these uh, receptors to possibly be endocytosed, where the visual arrestins don't have those um, binding sites. And so they just quench the reaction and the receptor stays in the plasma membrane. So the first question we wanted to ask is, what is the arrestin that co-localizes with melanopsin in the retina? And this is the work of a um, newly minted uh, doctor, uh, Evan Cameron, this is his thesis work. And what he uh, did was he first reacted, he probed the retina with a antibody to visual arrestin. And what you see is that it, it only lights up in the photo, traditional classical photoreceptor layer. And we don't see any um, uh, staining in the ganglion cell layer where melanopsin is expressed. And so what we then did was probe the retina with an a anti-beta arrestin-1 antibody and then we used a trick to localize melanopsin. And if you look over here where we see yellow, you see that they both are expressed in, um, in ganglion cells. So there's a co-expression of melanopsin and beta arrestin-1. And if we do the same experiment, only using an antibody to beta arrestin-2, uh, we see that the, uh, the beta arrestin-2 is expressed in ganglion cells. And, in, uh, and here's a melanopsin expressing cell, and they co-localize. 
So the suggestion would be that the deactivation of melanopsin in C2, in vivo, is, is being controlled by both uh, phosphorylation and the binding of beta arrestin 1 and 2. So we wanted to see if this uh, actually was happening. And so we used this PLA uh, uh, assay to uh, probe for melanopsin in the dark and the light. And you can see if we use beta arrestin 1 and a, a melanopsin antibody, in the dark we see no red dots. In the light, there are red dots in the uh, ganglion cell layer. And if we use a knockout mouse, a mouse that has no melanopsin, it's been knocked out. We don't see many red dots. There's a background. And the same kind of results for beta arrestin 2. So to uh, summarize what I've just shown you is that melanopsin C tail is phosphorylated in a light dependent manner in vivo and in vitro. And the phosphorylation is involved in a deactivation of the light response. And that beta arrestin 1 and 2 are most likely involved in the deactivation in a phosphorylation dependent fashion. So the next little story I'd like to tell you about is the phosphorylation of melanopsin by protein kinase A. If we run this uh, sequence through an, a program, we uh, identify three sites that are um, protein kinase A uh, uh, that would be phosphorylated by protein kinase A. And so what we did was we, protein kinase A is um, activated by an increase in cyclic AMP. So in this assay, we used the calcium fluorescence assay. We added uh, a cyclic AMP analog that is uh, not hydrolyzed. And we looked at the light response. Um, and what we see in the presence of uh, apromo cyclic AMP is a decrease in the amount of fluorescence. So we see a modulation in the response. So if we take data at the peak of the response and then plot it, what we see is that there's a cyclic AMP dependence in the modulation decrease. And this cyclic AMP decrease is inhibited in the presence of PKA um, uh, inhibitors. So um, it looks like the, uh, the inhibition or the modulation of the uh, fluorescence response is being mediated by PKA, which is activated by cyclic AMP. And then we can overcome that with a uh, PKA inhibitor. And so we did the same experiment. We used PLA, this PLA assay. And we probed for phosphorylation in the dark, because we know there's light-dependent phosphorylation. So this is in the dark and in the presence of a dopamine agonist. Now, dopamine is, uh, is binds to another G protein coupled receptor, activates adenylate cyclase, and increases cyclic AMP. And what you can see maybe is that in the presence of the agonist, there are red dots suggesting that there is phosphorylation going on in a dopamine dependent fashion. And so the dopamine is an important neurotransmitter in the retina. And in response to light, dopamine increases. Um, and it probably is um, feeding back to the suprachiasmic nucleus, which the response in the light is decreased uh, continuously during light. So what I've shown you so far is that melanopsin is phosphorylated both by a uh, light-dependent uh, G protein coupled receptor kinase for deactivation and phosphorylated for, by PKA for control of circadian control of melanopsin. Um, we're now in the process of testing this in vivo in mice. We're making some mice. Um, we're uh, going to uh, infect some uh, mice that have melanopsin knocked out with uh, a virus that has incorporated melanopsin with no PKA sites or no GRK sites, and then assay these animals for, oop, um, activity and electrophysiological. And this is work of um, um, my grad student, Preeti. So uh, I'd like to end with a uh, quick tour of some mathematical modeling that we've done of IPRGC signaling. 
So what we did is we have a hypothesized activation cascade here and our deactivation cascade here. Using this as a model, we generated a series of um, biochemical reactions that uh, then we um, made into um, uh, uh, a series of equations, differential equations, and then solved them uh, in MATLAB. And what we uh, did was, we, here we have the d real data in blue, and here is the model that our, uh, that, uh, so it describes our, uh, our data. And then if we take the same model, change a few parameters, we can model the calcium response in our transfected HEK cells. So to conclude, um, the endogenous, what I've shown you today is that endogenous chromophore of melanopsin is 11 cis retinal. Melanopsin's carboxy tail is phosphorylated by a GRK kinase. Melanopsin is deactivated by beta arrestin. And that melanopsin is phosphorylated PKA, which uh, modulates its activity. And that we can use a mathematical model to uh, look at the light response in both the uh, heterologous system and the IPRGCs. And since it's a similar model, what it suggests that is our heterologous expression system is a good place to probe the phototransduction cascade. And so finally, I'd <laughs> like to whoop, whoop, um, show you the people that have done the work here. Uh, um, people in my lab a few years ago. Here's Joe Blasek, who did a lot of the work on phosphorylation, Evan Cameron. Here's uh, Marquise Walker, who did the work on the chromophore. Preeti, who's working on um, the uh, transgenic mice, and Juan, who just joined the lab. And then here's two super undergrads that work with me. The mathematical modeling is part of a uh, grant from NSF that uh, the math and the biology department have. Um, it pairs undergraduates uh, in biology and math and the, with a faculty. And so I've been working with Dr. Kathleen Hoffman and Hai Yong Kang uh, on modeling this. And uh, here are the undergrads that have done all the work. Um, we've had on our fourth year of, of doing the modeling. And so I'd like to acknowledge all these people and funding from NIH and NSF. Thank you. So we have time for any questions? Huh? OK. So any questions? OK. I can take that one if you want. Take this, come on. Okay, sure. All right. Well, thank you, Phyllis. Uh, now we're going to see things a little different after that talk, right? <laughs> I had to say it. You know, it was just an, it was just a softball. Uh, it's my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Martyr. Eve Martyr received her undergraduate degree from the Prandash University, her PhD from the University of California, San Diego, and postdoctoral studies at the University of Oregon in Eugene in the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, France. She joined the faculty at Brandeis in 1978, where she has remained ever since. She is the Benfield Fer Professor of Neuroscience and head of the Division of Science at Brandeis University. Martyr is pre Dr. Martyr is present past president of the Society for Neuroscience. Her honors include membership in the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Institute of Medicine. Uh, she's received the Saul Peter Award, the Gerard Prize, the George Miller Award from the Cognitive Neuroscience Society, the Carl Spencer Lossley Prize from the American Physiological Society, 
an honorary doctorate from Bowdoin College, and the 2013 Gruber Prize in Neuroscience, which was described to me as, within that discipline, the Nobel Laureate, a Nobel Prize. Uh, Dr. Mara studies the dynamics of small neural circuits and was instrumental in demonstrating that neural circuits are not hardwired but can be reconfigured by neuromodularity neurons and substances. Her lab pioneered studies of homeostatic regulation of intrinsic membrane properties and stimulated work on the mechanism by which brains remain stable while allowing for change during development and learning. This is not her first time to campus. I can't remember what you said, it was like 15 years ago. Yeah, it's been, it's changed a little bit since then. So uh, it seems we're doing it. Uh, and we're pleased that we got her back. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Eve Marr. Can you hear me? Am I on? But I'm not on. Now I'm on. So I'd like to thank everybody for being here. And it's a a great pleasure to come back to UMBC and um, to see Phyllis in her beautiful red uh, jacket. Um, I should say before going on that Phyllis is one of my husband's most favorite people. So you guys are very, very lucky to have her. He's a very discerning individual. Um, so what I wanted to do today is sort of bring you up to date with some of the work we've been doing using um, a very simple nervous system, but to put it in the context of problems that I think are general to all nervous systems, um, human, all sorts of kinds of animals. Um, and, but before I actually start, I'm going to do a tiny little segue um, into some of the conclusions that have come out of my participation in the, uh, in the NIH um, director's initiative for the, for the brain the NIH working group for the uh, Obama Brain Initiative. Because I think some of that, it's hard, you know. Um, some of that I think will be interesting to all of you. Now, these devices are devices of the devil. Phyllis proved that to you before. And I will probably continue to demonstrate that to you. But before I get going, I would just like to um, acknowledge all the wonderful people in my lab who have contributed to the work um, I'm going to show you. Um, well, I'm not going to show you most of their work. But on the, on the left are the people in my present lab. And the, the list I'm most, how do you do this? <laughs> the list I'm most proud of, not most proud of, there are a whole bunch of people who started out my lab as graduate students and postdocs who are now um, independent investigators running their own labs. Um, and I think, I often show this just to prove to graduate students and postdocs that there is, is life after postdoc purgatory. Okay, so moving along. Okay, the NIH Brain Initiative 2014. First of all, this is a, a neuron from the crustacean stomatic ganglion, actually from a crab stomatic ganglion that's been filled with a dye and then imaged and now you're seeing a, a surface rendering of that cell. Now, all the biologists in the room are looking at that and saying, oh my god, every last one of those branches contains all these fabulous biological details. And every mathematician in the room is sort of saying, oh, I'm just going to pretend it's just a round circle. Right? <laughs> and that is one of the conundrums that we are all going to have to deal with as we move forward, as we try and bring to large circuits the kinds of analyses only possible in small circuits. So I think we're right now at a cusp of a fascinating time in neuroscience because from, from today past, it was really only possible to imagine dissecting circuit dynamics using the kind of small networks that my lab has worked on for the last 35 years. The future, and the future starts now, is we have been in the past few years and are going to be continuing to develop tools that will allow circuit analysis in large animals 
using many of the same conceptual frameworks that were really developed in small circuits. So I find it an incredibly exciting time. And it's not an accident that the, any of you who read the interim report, and you should do that if you're curious, will notice that a good portion of the work that was suggested is all about tool development. And that's developing the tools that will allow people to do work with the same clarity in large animals that we've been able to do in small animals. But what I'm going to do today is show you some of the work that we've done in small circuits. And if I remember, I'll try and explain what it was about the small circuit that allowed us to do this work that was not possible in large circuits, but should be possible going forward. OK, because it's really exciting. Now, so that just reiterates what I said before, understanding brain circuits now will require integration against scientific disciplines to achieve, now that's not a word, I understand, integration across time scales, level analysis, and data type. And just to re reiterate that, the core problem that we're going to be facing, and this is not only in neuroscience, but in biology in general. Um, as a biologist, we have to think which details of a biological system are crucial for understanding which functions. Because biologists revere details, right? We, we spend our life measuring things and capturing the detailed mechanisms underlying biological principles. But then, as you start thinking about trying to understand 86 billion neurons interacting so that you guys can pay attention to what I'm saying, you are all paying attention, right? Um, we have to imagine ways of being able to do do the kind of dimensionality reduction in order to understand which one of all these trillions of details that we have are going to be important for understanding higher level performance. And then the important other pieces, we have to learn how to design experiments to capture the data needed to inform understanding. And this comes to the sort of really is one of the the ideas that it was really brought forward to me in very great <laughs> detail in the discussions we've been having. OK, so there are some, of course, cultural conflicts. We all know about cultural conflicts. Biologists believe that mechanistic insight will inform big picture understandings. That's sort of bred into us. Mathematicians, physicists, engineers, I, I hate to put the boxes and stereotypes, but I'm going to. OK, actually, I don't even hate it. It's sometimes useful, are always looking for conceptual simplifications. That probably is, is true. And unfortunately, or fortunately, the brain is nonlinear, has built-in degeneracy, and I'll talk about degeneracy. That is to say, multiple mechanisms for doing similar sorts of things, just like the genetic code is, code is degenerate, is highly modulated, and I'll talk a little bit about modulation, and rarely stationary. Now, stationary in this context means doing the same thing for period of time. And the problem in neuroscience is the brain is never stationary. So if you want to use many kinds of theoretical tools, this becomes uh, a, a problem, which means that you can never do the same experiment twice um, on the same individual. I mean, you can do the experiment. You won't necessarily get the same answer. OK, just like me clicking this thing. I think there's a reason. I think this thing has to be, has to have a site. So the thing that became really clear from our discussions, which was not that clear to me beforehand, as we go forward into, did I skip a slide? Oh yeah, you knew. You saw it. The neuroscience of the future is going to involve giant data sets. That is, people are trying to develop tools that will allow them to record from 10,000 neurons at the same time or 100,000 neurons at the same time in behaving animals. The mind boggles the kind of data you get. Um, it's going to allow us to ask questions that require understanding multidimensional correlations, correlations between all those activity patterns and behavior and all sorts of underlying molecular mechanisms. We are going to need all kinds of new visualization tools to allow our meager brains to understand how to think about those data. And that also means we're going to need discipline dimensionality reduction, that's say ways of trying to collapse those data. And this is, of course, not true only of neuroscience. This is true of biology in general. But I think in neuroscience, the, the diversity of the structures of the brain make it even more um, apparent. 
Okay, now, one of the important things that came out of many of our discussions is something that probably a lot of people in this room already know, but it was articulated very clearly by Emory Brown, who's a, a good friend of mine. And that is, he feels very strongly and has been adamant about this, that doing an experiment that is uninformed by prior statistical thinking and prior theory is possibly always likely to generate data which cannot be properly analyzed. Now, it's one thing if you're looking at a simple linear system, that probably isn't true, but if you're thinking about recording from many, many, many hundreds of neurons in complex behaviors, Emory would argue, and I think he's probably right, and this is probably the same thing with molecular data in general, is if you haven't thought through the proper statistical design of the experiment before you do the experiment and thought about what kind of theoretical constraints you want to get from the data, you will almost invariably do the wrong experiment and will not be able to extract from those data the kind of richness that you would have wanted to. And so he was arguing, and I think we're all agreeing, that every biologist needs to know more statistics than they currently do. Students, learn statistics. Okay. Now, the problem that my lab has been studying moving right along in the recent, it's really good in this room, I can't see my watch. That means I can talk infinitely long, right? In the absence of data, how will I know when to stop? Um, we all know that that all brains are different, that's consonants of differential history and genetics. And I sometimes like to say that biologists have largely forgotten what they knew when they were two years old. Every two-year-old knows that every individual is different. Every two-year-old knows that every cat is different from every other cat. And most biologists to this day, although it's starting to be a little bit better, but certainly many, many of us, um, grew up in the tradition of doing the same experiment on multiple individuals, calculating a mean and a standard error, and assuming that every individual in the population was represented accurately by that mean. And I think in so doing, we have created uh, uh, all sorts of problems for ourselves, and it's now time, I would say, to unpack our data and seriously start asking questions about what individual variability um, actually means for the function of the brain. Now, what that, the question that this becomes then, how tightly tuned do the parameters that govern synaptic strength and intrinsic properties need to be for good enough circuit behavior? Or how different are the underlying structures of normal healthy brains? And this means how different can, can humans or animals be before they make the transition between health and disease? And what kinds of parameter changes um, are sort of on those boundaries? And then the last part of that is how a stable network function maintained over the animal's life while allowing learning and appropriate responses to environmental perturbations. So these are the questions that I'm largely going to be discussing with you today. Now, when we started doing this work, everybody who had been studying means and standard errors, you know, people like plotting standard errors because the error bar is so little, right? Even though in most cases it was probably most appropriately a standard deviation that should have been expressed. But leaving aside that, um, I think our reliance on looking at mean data would have caused most everybody to think that the respiratory centers in your brains might be different by a small amount, but not very different. Now, I know that everybody in this room has a perfectly good respiratory center in your brain stem. And I, why do I know that? I know that because you're all here and you're all breathing. Um, but I don't think any of us really thinks that you would have exactly the same pattern of synaptic connections, that the strengths of those synapses would be all different, that for that matter, one of you might have 593 pre-Botziger neurons and somebody else might have 622. And that we really need to know what those boundaries on that diversity are before we could know why some people might have, some children might be born with sleep apnea or, or sleep problems and other or breathing problems, et cetera, and others not. So that just sort of frames the, the question for you. but. But before um, sort of starting in on, on a directly addressing that question, I'm going to have to go back and give you a little bit 
about the system that we use in the laboratory. Now, uh, we study the crustaceans to Madagascar nervous system. This was one of the preparations that was established probably um, almost, God, is that true? Almost 50 years ago by investigators who were looking for small nervous systems where all the cells were identifiable, and this is really important, recognizable from animal to animal. They could all be recorded from routinely, and intracellular recordings were easy to make and would allow establishing connectivity patterns or working out synaptic relationships. And the crustacean stomatogastric ganglion has 30 neurons in it, um, slightly different numbers in different animals, but basically 30 neurons. And it turns out that it was a particularly useful preparation because the in vitro system mimics very closely the behavior that you see in vivo. And that's shown here in this slide. In this slide, Elizabeth Rezer, now maybe 30 years ago, poked holes in the lobster's carapace. She stuck wires in the muscles of the stomach and recorded here a pyloric rhythm. This is a triphasic motor pattern, LP, PY, PD, LP, PY, PD, LP, PY, PD. And this has about a one second period. So if you listened on the audio monitor, it would be And that's what she heard at that time. And the LP is a constrictor. This is constrictor one, constrictor two, dilator, constrictor one, constrictor two, dilator for a valve that moves the back end of the animal stomach. And many of you here are bona fide biologists and you know that crustaceans are not like humans and the stomach of a crustacean is a very complicated device which is actually much more like um, any of the systems that move that you use in locomotion or for that matter respiration. So these are motor neurons and when they fire discharges they directly excite the muscles that they innervate. Now, when you take the stomach out of the animal and dissect the stomatogastric nervous system off the surface of the stomach, you can put, and then put it in a petri dish filled with physiological solution, you can put intracellular electrodes in the somata, the cell bodies, to record the membrane potential as a function of time, and you see those intracellular recordings here. You see here depolarization, a burst of action potential as a hyperpolarization, and that continues. You can also put on extracellular electrodes that record discharges from the motor nerves, and you can see that these fictive motor patterns resemble very closely what the real motor patterns were. And that's why this preparation and several others like it were so important because it was, it was easy to demonstrate that the in vivo preparation resembled very closely the in vivo preparation. And therefore, one could do mechanistic studies on the isolated preparation and hopefully gain insights into the way it was working in the animal. Now, this slide just repeats the first two, these two panels are repeats of what you saw before. This is a connectivity diagram, as we used to call them. Today, these connectivity diagrams are called connectomes. Um, you know, God, that usually gets a laugh. You guys now laugh, right? Okay. Um, and what I, what I mean by that, this is a wiring diagram in which the interactions uh, among the cells are described. In these, all my diagrams, this resistor symbol denotes electrical coupling. That is to say cells are connected by gap junctions that allow current to flow between them. And the filled, filled circles here are chemical inhibitory synapses. So those of you who are neuroscientists know that synapses come in two basic flavors, excitatory synapses that tend to make cells more likely to fire, and inhibitory cells, inhibitory synapses that make cells less likely to fire. Now, in this case, you can see there's no excitation. All the synaptic connections are inhibitory. So what happens is these cells, these follower cells, the LP and the PY cells, fire on rebound from inhibition. So the, the way this network works is these three cells are a pacemaker kernel. Together, they depolarize and they act as a pacemaker. When they're depolarized, they inhibit the LP and the PY cells, and while they're depolarized, these guys are silent, and then these guys fire on rebound from that inhibition. 
with the LP and the PY cells firing in order because of the strength and time course of these synapses and the kinds of membrane currents that are expressed in these. So to, in order to go, if I had just given you this connectivity diagram or this connectome, there's no way you would have been able to predict from this connectivity diagram what these dynamics are. And that's because you're missing too much information. You're missing what all of the voltage and time dependent currents in each of the cells are. And you're missing the strength and time course of the synaptic connections. And then if you had all of that information and a way of putting that information back together again, you might be able to go from the connectome and all of those other dynamic data back to predicting the circuit dynamics, right? Now, but the only way you can put it all back together again is to build some sort of computational model. And that's why most people who started out as biologists or as experimental biologists working on small circuits ended up at some point in their career working with or collaborating with computational scientists of one form or another because they wanted to complete the reductionist loop and go backwards to explaining dynamics. And I was caught up in that like many of my friends. Okay, now, this is the 2011 version. I suppose I should do the 2014 version, but it just looks worse. These are the neuromodulators that influence the networks in the stomatogastric ganglion. Those modulators come in two ways. There are 25 pairs of modulatory neurons that dump a whole lot of neuropeptides, amines, and amino acids into the neuropil, that's where the synapses are, of the stomatogastric ganglion. The stomatogastric ganglion also sits in an artery just anterior of the heart, and there's a neurosecretory structure that dumps hormones into the hemolymph that get pumped directly over the ganglion. So there are tons of amines and peptides that reach the ganglion hormonally, and tons that are delivered as local hormones or as synaptic release. And many of the same substances are found in both, but some are just only hormonal and some are only in these input fibers. So this tells you that this little ganglion of only 30 neurons is incredibly richly modulated. And now let's just spend one or two minutes talking about what neuromodulation means for a circuit. This is now a very old slide from 1987, the work that Judith Eisen did in the days before we had computers. And she was recording from an isolated AB cell and she applied pilocarpine, which is a muscarinic cholinergic agonist. And on a slow time base, in response to the pilocarpine, the silent cell became bursty. And then she pushed the button on the chart recorder, thus expanding the trace so you can see these beautiful slow oscillations. And the same result happened when she applied 5-HT or serotonin. So these modulators completely transform the firing properties of cells. Now, if you think about this cell is part of the pacemaker for the rhythm. You can see that this will make a big difference for how that network works. This is uh, an experiment that was done by one of my ex-graduate students, Václav Thermi Lai, and she's studying the effect of one of those peptides on a synapse from the LP to the PD cell. In this case, an extra potential in the LP does no obvious, produces no obvious synaptic potential in the PD. In the presence of the peptide, you see this enormous IPSP. So here's an example of a synapse that was present anatomically, but functionally silent, and that the peptide reveals the presence of that synapse. So that is, again, an enormous change in synaptic strength that would, in principle, have effects on the network. Now, just to summarize, neuromodulators can produce qualitative changes in the firing properties of single neurons and very large changes in the amplitude of synaptic potentials. Um, and then if we look, this is a more complete version of the connectome or the connectivity in the pyloric rhythm. We found over the years that each neuron has multiple currents subject to modulation by many substances. Each synapse is subject to modulation by one or more substances. So in this circuit, everything is subject to modulation. And now the question is, if you're at all 
you know, computationally sophisticated, you're saying, my God, how does the circuit work? How does it deal with the fact that it's constantly be re being retuned to deal with every parameter in the network changing? And if you've ever built a model, you know that most models are not very robust to random parameter changes, and yet this network is built to be robust to massive changes in, in all of its parameters. Now, I don't know if I, I think I'm going to skip that, but just say, We'll come back to some of the messages in that slide I just went. Circuit reconfiguration. So when I started in, in graduate school, the idea was that you could establish the connectivity diagram of the connectome, and then you'd know how it worked. And that's because most of the electrophysiologists of the day came out of electrical engineering, where you had fixed components, and once you had wired it up, you would understand how it worked. And that early work that we did on neuromodulation allowed us to say, none of the components are fixed. These things are endlessly plastic, and that means the networks are potentially endlessly non-stationary. But what it also means is that the temporal dynamics and modulatory environment construct a functional circuit by tuning functional synaptic strength and modulating neuronal excitability. What this means, and this is the deep, you know, everything wonderful in what I've done in my life has the, the good side and the dark side. The good side is we now are starting to understand the mechanisms by which you get flexibility and plasticity in neural circuit function. The dark side is, as an experimentalist, it means that you can't really understand how a circuit works at any moment in time without knowing the modulatory state and how the modulatory state is influencing the parameters in the circuit while it's working under those conditions. And the reason that's the dark side is until possibly new generations of tools, it's impossible to do the experiments to study, for example, or measure synaptic strength without silencing the circuit. And once you've silenced it, you don't have the right synaptic strength. So there's this sort of giant, beautiful, awful uncertainty principle in here. But this is a deep message, which will hold whether you're talking about the retina, or whether you're talking about the amygdala, or whether you're talking about cortex, this still holds. And it's one of the reasons why the Human Brain Project in Europe is doomed to failure. I didn't say that. I did say that, but you know. OK, the problems. How can neuromodulation take a circuit from one stable functional configuration to another if many circuit parameters are subject to change? And then how can neuromodulation be reliable across individuals? We're going to come back to this if each has a brain with different underlying parameters. And I'm not really going to answer these, but I think these are posed questions for all of you and all of your brains. Now, before moving on, I'm going to do a little bit of a, an appendix right here to tell you that the pyloric rhythm, which you've been looking at, that beautiful triphasic pattern, is only one of two major motor, motor patterns produced by the 30 cells of the stomatic gastric ganglion. The other one is a slower motor pattern. So on, in these extracellular traces up here, the pyloric rhythm is seen here, LP, PY, PD, on this time base. And this is 10 seconds. I don't know why the time base got cut off. The other rhythm is seen here as activity in LG, which is now alternating with GM and DG. And so you can see the slow rhythm and then the fast rhythm. But notice, during the IC and VD activity, IC and VD are firing in an envelope timed with the gastric mill rhythm, but they're also firing in time with the fast pyloric rhythm. So these cells are, I don't know if they're properly called multiplexing, but they're participating in the generation of two rhythms, and they actually switch back and forth between being part of the pyloric rhythm, part of the gastric mill rhythm, or part of both rhythms at the same time. Now, can we see or try and understand how that happens using the connectivity of the network? 
This is actually the connectome of the full stomatogastric ganglion. These are the neurons that are usually thought of as doing the pyloric rhythm. These are the gastric mill neurons that produce that slower rhythm. But notice there's no real dividing ground here. There are electrical synapses between neurons across. There are chemical synapses across. So it's a, sort of an artificial convenience that we've grouped them into two separate groups of neurons. And the reason I'm bringing this up now is to just tell you that actually all neurons in your brain are connected to all of the neurons in the brain. And it's the convenience that we use to talk about different brain circuits and subcircuits because we can't study the whole brain at once. But actually, you probably will eventually have to be able to do that. And LG is one of those cells that switches back and forth. When, the, when there was no gastric mill rhythm present in this particular animal, the LG was firing in time with the pyloric rhythm. Here's PD, here's LG. The gastric rhythm now turned on, and LG flips into this long gastric mill pattern. So if you look at LG, you can see it's in the center of this network. So I had a graduate student, Gabrielle Gutierrez, who was really interested in trying to understand these switching neurons. And she noticed something which is really fascinating, which is that there's a really beautiful symmetrical five-cell circuit in the middle of the connectome. So IC is a neuron, which is one of the switchers. And she noted that it was electrically coupled to LP and also electric coupled to LG. And there's a reciprocal inhibition between LP and PD. And between LG and interneuron 1, there's an inhibition from interneuron 1 to IC and from PD to IC. So she noticed that there's this beautiful five cell sort of symmetrical circuit between a slow oscillator and a fast oscillator. So she decided to try and understand what would govern the behavior of this hub neuron as a function of some of these other parameters. And she decided, you know, first she was going to do a model of the whole network, and then she decided that was too hard. But the important thing I'd like you to look at, because of these electrical synapses, they're what I call parallel pathways. That is to say, PD inhibits IC monosynaptically. Everybody can see that. That's a direct connection. It also inhibits LP and therefore can inhibit IC through this electrical synapse. Likewise, interneuron 1 inhibits IC directly. And it also inhibits LG and therefore can inhibit IC through that electrical synapse. So this is what I call parallel pathways. And parallel pathways in networks are almost always, I mean, you always get parallel pathways when you have electrical coupling. But they can become a real confound to understanding how circuits work because it's very difficult to sometimes tell how much information is going directly and how much is going indirectly because of these parallel pathways. OK, so what did Gabrielle do? She decided to build a five cell network. Um, she decided to use oscillating neurons. These are very simple oscillators. They're called morris lecar models. They have a calcium current, a potassium current, and she also added an H current. This is a hyperpolarization activated inward current, and they have a leak current. So she called two of the neurons, F1 and F2. Those are FAST1, FAST2, two fast oscillators. And here they are in isolation. They're fast. Here's her HN neuron. It's a medium frequency oscillator. And here's a slow one and a slow two. These are two slow neurons. And then she hooked up with reciprocal inhibition. She called the two F1 and F2 neurons. And you can see they fire in alternation or out of phase, as you would predict for reciprocal inhibition. And then she hooked up S1 and S2. And they also fire in alternation when they're in the circuit, as you would predict. And here you can just see what happens when you put the three electrically coupled sort of backbone together, if these electrical connections are strong enough, they synchronize. And that is also what you would predict. So here are the isolated neurons, and here are these little submodules. What happens if you put the whole thing together? Nothing. OK, nothing still. Piece of crap. You know, it's just to keep you awake, right? 
Okay, so here's what she did when she put it all together. She called the strength of the electrical synapse, GEL, that means conductance of the electrical synapse. The conductances of these synapses she called G sin B, and G sin A are the strengths of these synapses. And here's one example where she put the five cell network together, and notice here the hub neuron is firing in time with the slow rhythm, and F1 and F2 are firing um, in alternation in the fast rhythm. And here's a different set of parameters, and you can see all five cells now are firing at the same period, the same frequency. So, but Gabriel wanted a way of visualizing the behavior of all the cells as a function of these parameters, so she came up with this really nice way of displaying it. You have these five concentric circles and squares, where the outside one is the frequency of the F1 neuron, then the F2 neuron, the square is the frequency of the hub neuron, and then the two inner circles are the frequencies of slow oscillators. So here, using that way of displaying it, the hub neuron is firing with the slow ones. So you've got, this is a color-coded heat map with fast being red and slow being blue. So here you can see these three slow and the two faster. Here in green, all of the five cells are firing at the same frequency. So now using this way of mapping things, Gabriel built what she called parameter scapes. And I love this because I just thought it was so, I came in one morning and one of these was on my desk and I ran down the hall and I said, Gabrielle, what is this? And she just looked at me and she said, well, that's a parameter scape. And I said, what? Anyway, so what she's done here is she's plotted the strength of G sin A on the X and the strength of the electrical synapse on the Y. And now at each point on the grid, you can see what the five cell network is doing. So here is a whole region of parameter space where you can see the fast cell, one of the fast cells is firing fast, all the other four cells are firing slowly. Here there's a region of parameter space where they're all firing at the same frequency. Here there's a region where you've got two firing fast and three firing more slowly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what this allows you to visualize the boundaries between the network dynamics as a function of these two parameters. So what it also allows you to see visually is what would happen if we applied a modulator in this case that influenced G sin A. If you started out here and you applied a modulator that produced a relatively modest change in that synaptic strength but it was over here, you might go across one of these boundaries and completely transform the behavior of the circuit. On the other hand, if you had that same modulator but your starting state was over here, you might have an enormous change in synaptic strength, but no change in, in the qualitative behavior of the circuit. And likewise, going in the other direction, you could imagine a different modulator which influenced this property of the circuit, and it also could have produce a possibly modest change in the strength of the circuit, of the, of the synapse, but bring you across a boundary, whereas over here, it might not produce much qualitative change. So this is a really easy way of understanding what is often called state-dependent neuromodulation, the fact that a neuromodulator may have very large transformative effects, even though the cellular mechanism may be fairly modest, and much, and whereas other times really large cellular changes might have very little effects on the circuit behavior. And I think every theorist knows this, but it's, it's just a nice way of visualizing it. But Gabrielle made one more observation, which I think is really cool. And again, this any theorist probably also knows this. But here's our five cell circuit. And she started out with one set of parameters. And we have HN is firing with the slow rhythm here. These three cells are firing together. Those two are, these are firing slowly. These are firing quickly. And then she decreased the strength of the synapse. And now HN started firing quickly, and it moves into firing in time with the fast oscillator. Then she went back, and she changed the strength of the electrical synapses. And again, she was able to switch HN into firing in time with the fast oscillators. 
And then she did a completely different manipulation. She decreased the strength of these synapses. And again, she was able to switch HN from firing fast, I mean, from firing slowly to firing fast. So the reason I'm showing you this is this is what we'll call degenerate mechanisms. These are three entirely different cellular mechanisms of action. And they are producing virtually identical changes in circuit behavior. Now this should be a wake up call to anybody who's trying to do optogenetic manipulations or genetic manipulations to try and understand some change in circuit performance. Group one in, in Italy might do this experiment and they'd say, oh, now we understand why, why this change happens. Group two might be sitting in Japan. They might do this experiment and they get the answer and they say, oh, the Italians are wrong. Right? This would never happen. The Japanese would never say the Italians are wrong. And then the American lab is sitting somewhere in San Diego, and they do this experiment, and they say, oh, the Japanese and the Italians are both wrong. Right? Where actually all three groups doing different manipulations are all right. That is to say, each of them has seen a piece of the story. And this is a really important understanding that everybody who's trying to do genetic and optogenetic or pharmacological manipulations has to understand. Any manipulation you do, de facto, may only give you a piece of the answer. And just because you see an effect doesn't mean it's the only way you can get that effect. OK, I wonder what time it is. When, how long have I been talking? Does anyone know? I have plenty. Well, good, I have plenty more to talk about. But the <laughs> Oh, I've got all the time in the world. OK. So, so we're going to leave that, those, set, those set of lessons and now move to another set of lessons. I, I have my talks, little lesson sets. You know, you can think about them as take home messages. OK, so I'm going to start with now building a model neuron. This is an isopotential neuron, which is a very bad oversimplification of that beautiful neuron I showed you on the first slide. But nonetheless, we can learn some really important things from it. This neuron has a leak current. It has a fast sodium channel conductance. It has a calcium current. It has three potassium currents. It has what we call a delayed rectifier. That's the potassium current that repolarizes the action potential, usually. A calcium activated potassium conductance. And a fast transient outward current or an A current. So it has three potassium currents, a calcium current, a sodium current, and a leak. And an intracellular calcium buffer. So depending on the properties of the, the number of each one of those channels, this model can either be silent. This is just one set of what we call maximal conductances or conductance densities. That is to say the number of channels of each kind. Here's one set of parameters, the neuron is silent. A different set, and it's firing tonically, you're just firing single action potentials, a different set still, and now it's firing in bursts of action potentials. Okay? So this tells you what most beginning neuroscientists learn, which is the behavior of the cell depends on the number and kind of ion channels in its membrane. But the problem that, that uh, Mark Goldman, who was a graduate student at the time with Larry Abbott's lab, wanted to ask was how different could be the sets of conductances that would give a specific kind of behavior, for example, bursting neurons. How different can these conductances be and give this activity pattern? So what Mark did is he built about, this was many years ago, this was in 1999, so, yeah, 1999. He built 5,000 models by randomly choosing values of the maximal conductances and number of channels for each of these things. And then he simulated them all, and then he classified them according to what kind of behavior they produced. And what he showed, first of all, is that the sodium conductance could either be large or small, large or small, and the cell could either be silent, tonic, or bursting. So he's, you made silent blue and tonic red and green, he called this green. I don't call that green. It's puke color, right? But anyway, um, bursting neurons. And so you can see that the same conductance can either be small or large, and the cell could have any of those behaviors. 
Likewise, the calcium conductance could be small or large and have any of those behaviors. The A current could be small or large, or the calcium activated K, or the uh, the delayed rectifier. What that tells you is that the value of one current alone does not give you enough information to tell you what the behavior of the cell is going to be. Although there are plenty of papers written and published in good journals that will tell you that that's true, but it's, it's an accident if it's true. But then Mark, what he did is he plotted the value of the A current against the calcium activated potassium current against the delayed rectifier. So those are the three potassium currents. But you notice in here, there are regions, large regions, where all three types of behaviors are also seen. So this tells you that the correlated values of those three potassium currents, again, do not give you enough information to know what the cell is going to do. Whoops, it skipped one. Yes, and this is the same plot I just showed you, but then Mark plotted the A current against the calcium current against the same current, and he was very happy because now he got these slabs of activity where the correlated values of these three currents actually give you regions where you have silent or tonic activity or bursting activity. He was really pleased because it said the model was behaving well, I looked at that and I went into a moment of mourning. I thought it was really bad news. Now why is the fact that you have the correlated values of these predicting the cell's activity bad news? It's bad news to me as the biologist because to know what the cell was doing, I would need correlated measurements of three of the five currents in the cell but I wouldn't know a priori ahead of time which three of the five I would need to be able to measure. So that was bad enough. But the worst thing is that no decent biophysicist ever wants to have to measure the A current, the calcium current, and the sodium current in the same neuron. Because this is telling you you need to measure these three currents in the same neuron to know where you were in parameter space. And it's really a hard thing to do. So what this tells you is yes, there is enough information in the correlated values of some parameters to predict the behavior of the system, but you don't necessarily know ahead of time which those are. And as an experimentalist, you want to be able to do all the, all the appropriate measurements on the same cell. And so that's the other big picture idea that I think has come out of our work in the last 10 years, which is we have to do a parameter, a, basically a paradigm shift and go from looking at things, you know, doing measurements of one thing in one set of cells, something else, another set of cells, another set of cells, and then putting them together and think you're going to get the answer. I'm going to show you that that's not necessarily true by another little experiment that Mark did, which is in that same group of 5,000 neurons, he had about 150 that were single spike bursters. Here are three of them. This is a cell which depolarizes, fires an action potential, and has a plateau. It's a lot like a cardiac action potential. Here's another one. Here's another one. This particular one had a big sodium current and a small delayed rectifier, potassium current. This one, although it looks very similar to that one, has a really small sodium conductance and a big delayed rectifier. And this one was small in both. And that's because the other three currents in these cells were different. So here we have three single spike bursters, and all of the single spike bursters are shown here in blue dots. And notice the shape of this curve. Some of them had really large delayed rectifier currents, some had small, some had large same currents, etc. Some had small. But then what Mark did is he took all of these blue dots and he calculated the mean sodium current in all this population, the mean delayed rectifier in all that population, and here are the means. And then he built a model from those mean values. And when he built the model, he didn't get a single spike burst, he got a three spike burst. And so we, we call this failure of averaging. So when he used the means and lost those correlations that were there, he failed to recover the behavior in the mean of every individual that went into that mean. Now this does not have to happen, but it can happen. In this case, it happens because of this structure 
of the, of the parameter space. But the deep lesson for biologists is you really can't, you don't know whether you can get away with measuring the sodium current in 20 cells, measuring the potassium current in another 20 cells, and the calcium current in another 20 cells, and trying to put them together. Because you might get away with it, but you might not. And I think it's a very important um, thing to worry about, because no one in their right mind wants to have to be able to measure everything in the same cell. On the other hand, that's really what we want to be able to do. OK, moving along. That's, uh, now, we're getting later in time. Astrid Prince was a postdoc in my lab, and she wanted to build a um, model of the pyloric rhythm. I've had many students want to build models of things, and they, they start with that idea, and they end up doing something truly wonderful and quite different from what they thought they were going to do in the beginning. So Astrid wanted to build a model of the pyloric rhythm. So she wanted to adapt Mark's model um, and get a good model for the ABPD cell group and a good model for the LP and a good model for the PY. So she started playing with the conductances to try and get models that reflected the kind of behavior that those cells typically produce. And she did this for about a week, and really bad things were coming out of her mouth. I mean, she was, she was German, so they were all in German, but I knew they were bad. I didn't understand a word of them, but I, I got the sense. And all of a sudden, she went silent. And she was perfectly happy for a while. And what she had decided to do after a week of complaining, she chose, she had eight currents in this model. She chose six values for each of the eight currents, and she simulated all combinations of the six, six values for the eight currents. And for a while, they were running on every computer in the lab until I discovered this, and I made her put it on the cluster. And so she ran 1.7 million model neurons, and then she selected from that population neurons that she thought were good candidate pacemaker models, good candidates for the LP, good candidates for the PY. And then she chose five good candidate LP models, six KNAPYs, five pacemakers, and she chose five or six values for each of the synaptic connections in the network. And then she ran all against all again, so she ran 20 million model networks. She ran them all, simulated them all in the cluster, and then she asked how many of them were, would produce models that looked like pyloric rhythm. So some of them were triphasic in the right order, that's a good start. Some of the triphasic in the wrong order. Others of them weren't triphasic, or which is really junky. So she started looking at this population. And so this was the 20 million. 19% of them were triphasic in the right order. And 2.4% of them were triphasic in the right order and had ranges of frequencies and phase relationships and number of spikes per burst that were similar to what Dirk Bucher had measured in 99 examples of the Homaris pyloric rhythm. So basically, instead of looking for a single model, she was looking for all the models that fit within the ranges that we recorded in the biological system, looking at a large data set. So those she called successful pyloric models. Now, it was only 2.4% of all of them, but 2.4% of uh, 20 million is 400,000. So there were 400,000 successful models. And when we were writing this paper, I asked her to find two that had pretty similar outputs and different conductances. So I asked her that, and she came back about three hours later. So it tells you how easy it was for her to do this. So this was model network one, model network two. They have pretty similar behaviors, and when we look Below, at some of the properties, you can see they're entirely different. So here you have the AB to LP synapse is big here, small here. The PY LP synapse is big here, small there. The PY sodium current is big here, small there, et cetera, et cetera. This set of parameters and this set of parameters are both capable of producing very similar outputs, although they're entirely different. So I looked at this and I loved it. I loved it as did almost every other biologist who looked at it. And we loved it, probably for the reason some of you are loving it, because it said that biological systems don't have to be perfectly tuned to get the right answer. 
We also looked at this and said, well, maybe the PY neurons H current can vary so much because it's being compensated for by the strength or weakness of another property in the network. When I started talking about this, I, I got a tremendous amount of flack from theorists. And the flack came in all sorts of different flavors. They're one of the things that they said, I had people say to me, oh, it can't be this way because everybody knows that biology is optimal. And I said, since when is biology ever optimal? So that one, God. So that one I didn't worry about. But some of the theorists had two other, other thoughts which were actually very useful, which helped us formulate the next set of questions. Many of them said, this, this value can be large here and small there, and maybe that's because it just doesn't matter. Because obviously, if that, if that, if that current isn't doing very much, well, it doesn't matter what value it's, it is. And that's true. That's true. The other thing they said is, and they said this with some strength, is here you're just looking at a static snapshot of the cell's behavior, or these network's behavior. This set of parameters and this set of parameters will definitely respond differently to perturbations. They have to, right? Because they're different underlying structures. So in the universe of all possible perturbations, there has to be a perturbation that will separate these two. And that's absolutely true. And so eventually what I started saying, saying to myself, the question is not whether crab one and crab two can be different and can show similar behavior when we just take them out of the animal and look at them. The question is whether this set of conductances and this set of conductances, if these actually reflected what was going on in the crab, whether both sets could respond to the perturbations that the animal normally sees in its life, right? So you understand um, not not whether there is some perturbation that can separate them, but whether the perturbations the animals normally see, um, whether they can be robust to those. So this work le led, led us to ask these questions. How variable the parameters in real biological networks? Which parameters are highly variable because they just don't matter? Which variations are indications of network level compensation? And how reliable are networks with different underlying structures against environmental perturbations or neuromodulation? So that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years. Um, I'll quickly show you the answer to this, and then I'll end with some of the things we've been doing to answer this. I'll just tell you here, some of those variations are probably due to the fact that those currents or those changes probably just don't matter very much under many conditions. Okay, so that first question. I have to remember that you have to face this to that direction and use your left hand. It's hard. So what Dave Schultz and Jean-Marc Gaillard, who were two postdocs in the lab at the time, did is they recorded from the motor patterns to begin with. Here's LP and PD. And then, so they got the activity to begin with. Then Jean-Marc went in to the LP cell with two electro voltage clamp to measure currents. And then Dave pulled out individual cells to do real-time PCR on those so that we would have the copy number for the membrane currents as well as the voltage clamp data on the same cell. And so here you see LP1 and LP2. Each animal only has one LP cell. So this is animal one, animal two. And notice that when those cells were in the network, their behavior was really virtually identical. Here they are superimposed. You can see they really look very similar. But in voltage clamp, the blue cell had a much larger calcium activated potassium current than the green cell, and it had a larger A current as well. And if you look across the population at the voltage clamp data, you see about a two to five fold range in the conductance densities for these three membrane currents. When we look at the mRNAs for those channels, what you see are again a two to five, two to fold, six fold range. But interestingly, when Dave plotted the conductance on the X and the copy number on the Y for two of these currents, you see these really beautiful tight correlations. So for these channels in this cell, the copy number is actually a very, 
is a very good predictor of the amount of protein in the membrane. And we can talk about why that actually is um, in these cells because it certainly didn't need to be that way. Okay, but subsequently, we and many other people did a lot more experiments of this kind and the take home lesson is in our system and Ron Calabrese's beautiful work in Leach and other places where people can do this experiment. Synaptic and intrinsic membrane conductance is very two to six fold when measuring the same identified neuron in different animals. Now this is the kind of experiment that today people could imagine doing in vertebrates but 10 years ago they couldn't. But now that you can do RNA-seq on individual neurons, one could do exactly this kind of experiment either in labeled neurons in flies or in genetically marked neurons in, in mice, etc. And then I told you this already, some of the parameter variations don't matter while other parts of compensating processes. So I'm now going to go and quickly end with experiments we did looking for a perturbation that we can ask, can we see how the population responds to a perturbation that it naturally sees or, and that could, could be useful to examine how reliable networks with these different, these two to six fold ranges of some of these important parameters are, can they yet be robust to a perturbation that's important for the animal? Now the crabs we work on come from the Boston Harbor and the northern Atlantic around where we are and they see enormous temperature fluctuations and temperature is a really interesting global perturbation because it will influence every biochemical process in the cell and if you think about all those different rates changing with different temperature dependencies it's hard to imagine that these networks can stay producing constant behavior so you all probably know that biologists talk about Q10s, which is just the temperature sensitivity of a biological process. A Q10 of one, there's the equation, there's an exponential in there. Q10 of one means you're completely temperature compensated. A Q10 of two is what I was taught when I was an undergraduate that biological systems showed. A Q10 of three, obviously you can see the exponential. Now you see this enormous change and ion channels in general have Q10s that can go from two to 100. So, and although most biological processes tend to have Q10s in the two to three range. So what happens when we look at the pyloric rhythm? And Lamont Tang did these experiments. So here's an animal where the pyloric rhythm was recorded at cold temperature. Here's PDLPPY, a beautiful pyloric rhythm. Here's the same animal now recorded. Lamont just increased the temperature and at 19 degrees and you still see your beautiful pyloric rhythm. And here you see a plot of network frequency as a function of temperature. It's a nice straight line with a, an approximate Q10, if it's not really appropriate to call it that, but a Q10 of 2.3 and that's sort of canonical. This is what you would have expected pretty much. But the really cool thing is that the phase relationships, that is to say the relative timing of the cells are completely temperature compensated. They're completely invariant. When PD turns off and LP turns on and LP turns off and PY turns on, they're completely stable. And if you think about maintaining a constant pattern, what you need are the phase relationships to be maintained. So here we have a beautiful system where the frequency is changing and the phase relationships are being stable. And these are now intracellular recordings that Lamont made at 7, 11, 15, 19, 23 degrees. And then using the computer, he was actually able to scale out time so he could overlay the 7, 11, and 19 degree recordings. And you can see how beautifully they lie right on top of each other. So even though every single membrane current is changing with temperature, they're changing in such a way that the membrane project potential traje trajectory is actually somehow or they're being protected. And I looked at this and I just thought it was just so amazingly beautiful. So the temperatures I've been showing you so far, this range, 7 to 23 degrees, this is the range that these animals will see. Sometimes they'll, I mean, that's normal for the, the waters in which they live. Um, they can see 10 degree temperature changes sometimes in a day, but certainly from winter to summer they see these temperatures. 
What happens when you go hotter, warmer? Here we have what we'll call a crash. Here's a 23 degree, beautiful triphasic rhythm. Lamont took it up to 31 degrees. He got a complete crash. Everybody, and this was a crash, not a cook, because when he went back down to 23 degrees, you can see the rhythm comes back, okay? And you can actually bring them back and forth um, and do this repeatedly. Okay, so now we reasoned. If these animals had different underlying parameters, maybe they would crash differently. Maybe they all can be robust during the temperatures that they usually used to seeing, but if we, we stress them with really, really extreme temperatures, maybe we'll start seeing the, the results of their underlying temperature, underlying parameter differences. So to do that, we wanted a way of displaying those um, behaviors, and so we adapted a spectrogram, you know, like birdsong people usually plot, where now for each cell, we're plotting the power as a function of time on a scale from zero to six hertz. So this is PD, LP, PY. Most of the power here is at the same frequency. And this is just the harmonic in there. And here at 23 degrees, so this is a little snippet of that taken right here. Here's a little snippet of this longer recording. This allows us to look at 250 or 300 seconds now, so here's the full 300 seconds. There's a little snippet here which you can start seeing some discontinuities, but now you can see the pattern has gotten much more disrupted. That is to say it's still doing almost okay, but it's starting to get raunchy. At 27 degrees you can see periods of crash inter interposed with periods of stable rhythm. And here at 31, here's a piece right here with a complete crash but they're also intermittent bouts of activity. So now using this way of displaying the data, we can look at a bunch of animals. And that's what you see here. These are animals that were all cold acclimated, so they had been held for three weeks at seven degrees. So they all had the same temperature history. And for each animal, animal A, B, C, D, E, three animals, we have P, D, L, P, P, Y. And now at 15, you can see these red lines straight across, pretty well behaved. At 15 and 19, most of them still look pretty well behaved. You have red and yellow lines pretty much straight across. At 23, here's an animal which is starting to get a little disrupted, whereas another animal might still be maintaining its behavior pretty well. At 27 degrees, this one's still doing pretty well. This one is starting to get pretty messed up, and this one is totally messed up. And this one, he didn't even take to 31 because it was completely crashed by the time he got it to bit 28 or so. But if we look at the others at 31, we can see all four of these others, this one was completely crashed, and these all four were showing intermittent crashes, but the dynamics of these intermittent crashes are completely different. Here you're getting these fast bouts on and off. Here you're getting fast bouts on and off, but with different kinds of dynamics through here. Here, LP went com almost completely silent for the whole time, whereas PY and PD were starting, to, were trying to keep going. And here you got these very low frequency intermittent crashes. So these behaviors are all crashes, but they're all crashes with very different underlying dynamics, as if each of those different underlying sets of parameters are each, each preparation is crashing differently because of its different underlying structure. And so just to conclude, I'd just say at low temperatures, all networks are well behaved, showing consistent change in frequency and outstanding temperature compensation. And this is really important, but each individual animal crashes with individual dynamics as predicted by their underlying parameter differences. And I would just like to end by saying, that multiple good enough solutions to circuit performance, that is to say, all those different sets of underlying um, parameters in the circuit in the population ensures a substrate for evolution under diverse environmental conditions. So this is beyond optimality to good enough, and I'll stop there. Thanks.
What happens now? <laughs> They're just stunned into. Here you go. So, okay, those different crashes you see, um, is that calling with uh, difference in the expression of each of those? I didn't hear you. Does that correlate with, with, with different expressions of each of those, which might help to get the system back? So we've never actually looked at heat shock proteins, but people often ask us, and so we should do that. You know, not very. I mean, I don't know how much is. No, you know, every time because we're working in a in a crab, that means to do that we'd have to go and find the heat shock protein and do the biology. But yes, we can easily do that. Um, I I'm not sure about that. Um, what? So we just need to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, about our brain inside. Um, I want to ask you about the, the human brain study. Um, I, I heard uh, you saying that you have to separate them from the tier study. Uh, why do you need and uh, maybe MET to focus on the brain function? And the other one is uh, function MI with the cells together on the local uh, area. I don't know if you have any comments. Well, nothing in, nothing in MRI or functional MRI is really sufficient resolution to, I mean, structural MRI will give you a sense of just the anatomical big picture of what's there. And then functional MRI will tell you, if you're lucky, what's working together with what. But I think it's very important to remember that both methods are by the standards of really trying to understand how real brain circuits work, are very low resolution. Remember, there are millions of cells per voxel in all of those methods. So I think they're very useful for some things. Like they're really useful after you know, an injury to see what sort of gross things have been changed. But for really understanding circuit dynamics, I think we need to get those methods to a hundredfold or a thousandfold higher resolution, which is what some of the brain initiative projects are going to try and do, is increase the resolution of those images, of those methods. Yeah. I assume you have those lights because you're filming. No, it's just to make you. The lights are awful. <laughs> There's probably a switch on it. Just shout. Okay. You can do that. I bet so you can do that. I can do it. I, I don't have rust. That's it. It's like <laughs> question, two questions actually. One, based on what you say, do you think that the pathologies that we are all interested in, like you know, neurological disorders, could be explained by a single uh, type of a defect, or will we have to go to a more involved circuit analysis to find? Okay, so there, the there, there, are two, there are two answers to that question. There are some human neurological disorders that we know are channelopathies that arise from mutations in very specific ion channel genes. There are some seizure disorders which are absolutely known to result from defects in one or another channel. So there are some fraction of easy things, which are single gene mutations. Now, most of the things you really care about are almost certainly circuit problems. Um, so if you look at, I mean, I think what people would say today is if you look at a problem like schizophrenia, or autism, or most seizure disorders, or depression, or Alzheimer's, that these are all circuit problems. And that there are so many ways that a circuit can go wrong, and so many compensatory mechanisms that take place over the lifetime of a person, so that you know they may go wrong in different ways, in very interesting different ways as you look individual to individual. So I think my guess is that most of the easy 
simple answers have been found because there have been enough genetic studies on enough people with enough so that the easy channelopathies have been found, the easy single gene mutation disorders have probably, not all, but mostly been found, and that most people in the field would say that the hard ones, the interesting, the interesting hard ones, are all circuit problems. And that's why the Brain Initiative is focusing on developing new tools for doing circuit mapping at high resolution in human brains, eventually in human brains, because the intuition is that you need to know whether um, how those circuits are, are crossing those boundaries between, you know, if you think about the boundaries between one kind of behavior and another kind of behavior, in one individual you might be just on the good side of one of those boundaries and have a very small perturbing event bring you across a state change. And in another individual, you may be, have that same small perturbing event, but be far enough from those boundaries so you never see the change in circuit performance. So I think that's what people would mostly say today. And that's why it's so hard to solve these problems. Yes? Okay, so if, if, if given that, would you say that there's any uh, hope for, for some sort of you know, intervention in something like schizophrenia or, or autism? Um, that it sounds like the circuit can be broken in so many ways. But that means you don't have to fix it in any one way. I mean, you can again look at this as the, the downside or the upside. You can turn that around and say, if all you need to do, all you need to do, is get that circuit back into an appropriate mode of behavior, you, you can possibly fix it by influence it by not undoing what was broken, but by a different route, which is why probably any of the drugs that actually work, work. They almost certainly don't undo what was broken. They almost certainly do something orthogonal that allow it to come back to. So that's the, the other side of that. You know, there's no reason to suspect that what you have to do to make someone go from being you know, having florid symptoms and schizophrenia to no longer having florid symptoms is tell you anything about the mechanism that produced that. You just need a path back. So I think that's the optimistic side, that you don't have to actually fix what's broken. You just have to give it another path. And then let everything retune. One more question? I can see that. I can't hear you. Just in general, uh, in terms of circuit patterns, um, have you, are, are you aware of any differences between males and females? Well, there certainly are differences between males and females in parts of the brain. Right. Um, and, and, you know, if you think about all that neuromodulation, it certainly is very different between males and females. Um, there are people who are, all sorts of people who are doing all sorts of things like fMRI and stuff like that to look for male and female specific behaviors. They're almost certainly going to be there, whether they're there in, in certainly the sexually dimorphic behaviors that are controlled by certain parts of the brain, you're going to see it there in the circuits. Um, whether that means you're necessarily going to see sexually dimorphic um, changes in how the visual system works, whether you know V1 is going to be any different. My guess, most people would doubt. So, but certainly we all know that estrogen and testosterone have very dramatic effects on the brain. And progesterone is really nasty stuff. Let's take this opportunity to thank you.